Today with us we have Karen Burke. She teaches women's Bible study and we are going to be uh, talking with her about her process and d among a lot of different other things. Karen, thanks for coming by and talking with me today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited about this because I want to, um, I think what you do is really cool and then I I'd like to catch up with you too because it's been a while since it's we talked. It's been talk, a long time. So, so tell us, uh, First of all, just tell us a little bit about yourself, like where you're from, all that stuff. Okay, I grew up in South America. Actually, my parents were missionaries, and um, so I spent 15 of the first 18 years of my life there. And then I came back to the States for college and met my husband, Dave. He was in the military, so I left college and went off to Germany with him for seven years. And we eventually settled here in Huntsville. We have three sons who are pretty much grown. Our oldest son, Garrett, is married. And our middle son, Tucker, is also married, and our youngest son, Philip, just went off to University of Alabama. So we are new empty nesters, and it's pretty awesome. <laughs> we're close there, so I'm excited to get to that point, too. So. Yeah, we're loving it. It's not <laughs> been a bad thing for us at all. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about the whole process of your Bible study and then how that okay. works out. How did you get started uh, teaching women's Bible study? It's... You know, amazingly, ten. if you had asked me 10 years ago if I'd be teaching women's Bible study, I would have told you absolutely not. There was no way. Um, my husband, Dave, is a teacher, and so I had always sat under his teaching, and um, he's a very academic teacher. And I thought, well, I could never do that. And he had been telling me for years, you need to teach, you need to teach. And I kept saying, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a teacher. And then one summer, I had discovered this book. It was called Having a Merry Heart in a Martha World. And I was talking to our women's ministry director. And one thing led to another. And the next thing I knew, I was teaching through this book. <laughs> and one of the things that I discovered was really not so much that I was such an awesome teacher but I was willing to get up in front of the class and I could speak in front of people and I was willing to put in the time to study. And so when I got up in front of people, I was prepared and God began to use that obedience. And so I started teaching seven, eight years ago probably and I haven't stopped since and I absolutely love it. So how is the process for you to, to prepare for study? Like how do you pick a study and then what do you, how much time do you put into it? And well, okay, how I pick a study, really I spend, something will begin to eat at me or to, the same passage of scripture will begin to come up over and over and over again. And so then I just kind of start studying that for myself. And that really is actually how my studies end up coming about. I had done book studies for, in the very beginning. And then a group of college girls came to me and said, well, we just want to study a book of the Bible. And even though I had been in church all my life, I didn't know how to prepare, I didn't know how to do a Bible study on the book of the Bible. And so what I began to do was I started off, we started with the book of James, and I began to use other people's material in my preparation. And then one day I thought, I don't really like the way they're doing it. I think I would go this direction with it. And so at that point then, I just took off and started doing my own thing and um, began to write my own material. And so that's what I do now. We are actually right now doing a couple of sessions on guarding the heart, and then we're going to move into Colossians 3. And so I've been studying through Colossians for probably about the last four months in preparation for that. So the, do you find that most people, when they come into one of your Bible studies, that they, don't, they too don't know how to study Scripture, that they've always like depended on someone else to teach them? Yes, absolutely. And so when I write my material, I try to keep that in mind. When I do, I always prepare homework. It's minimal homework, probably 10 or 15 minutes a day. Um, but it gets them into the Bible. And I frequently have questions that encourages them to use their, their, the tools in their Bible, concordance, cross-references, getting on the Internet and looking at commentaries, things of that nature. And so that's part of my preparation because my desire is to equip women to be able to study on their own. So what are some of the tools that you use to, to do that? Like you said, the concordance. Like, Are there websites or are there books that you use generally? Um, there's a great website. It's um, biblos.com, um, and I think it also goes to biblehub.com, and I use that a lot because it has different versions of the Bible. It has the Greek. It has the Hebrew. It has parallel passages. It has um, a concordance in it, and so I use that site a lot in my own personal preparation. That's cool. So are there any um, particular um, books that you're studying right now? 
Um, well, right now we're doing Colossians. We've been in the series. We did a series called Walking Through the Stories. And that started two and a half years ago when we started with Genesis 1. And we began to walk through from in the beginning God. And we walked all the way through the stories of um, Samuel, Saul, and David. We just finished that back in November. And so now we're moving in to do, to do the New Testament. So it. what about the, um, where do you do these uh, Bible studies at? Right now I'm teaching at the Southeast YMCA. And we meet on Thursday mornings. Um, and so that, that's my main venue for teaching. Um, also, one of the things that we've started that has progressed as, as time has gone by is that women who serve overseas, that's really my passion, is to teach and shepherd women, particularly women who serve overseas in capacity as missionaries, women in ministry positions, pastors' wives, women who are serving on staff in churches, women who are running nonprofit organizations. Because one of the things I've found is that they don't have a place to just go and be and to study. They don't have anybody pouring into them. And so the Y provides a place for local people to come, but there was also such a great need for being overseas. And so one of the doors that God opened up was for me to be able to set up a website and to be able to podcast Bible studies. And so I started doing that back in 08. And, um, so we've had Bible studies on the internet since then. It serves two purposes. It also allows women overseas to, to listen in at their convenience. But when women have to miss Bible study on Thursday mornings, they can also listen to that as well. So the, uh, the why did you, I know you, you mentioned a, a, a little bit about this, but what, why do you think that is like with leadership, people in leadership, why do you think it is that they uh, struggle to find people to mentor them or especially like older people because a lot of times you find a lot of younger people I know the situations that we've been in um, you generally have a lot of younger population but um, being in kind of having kids gone and all of that there are people that are in ministry that are younger than you like talk a little bit about the importance of being in leadership or being a missionary and needing to study the scripture oh I mean I think it's just critical and I think what happens is we put missionaries and pastors wives and people who are on staff in these on these pedestals and assume that you know they're already doing all of this stuff and so I think to a certain extent there's an image that has to be that that women in particular feel like they have to uphold and I don't mean that in a negative sense it's just kind of what our culture has created and so there are very few places Let's, let's use a pastor's wife, for example. Who is she going to talk to if she and her husband are struggling? She can't go to the members of her congregation. And so, because that, that's just awkward. That's not what somebody sitting in the pew wants to know that their pastor and his wife is having, you know, that they're having a struggle. And so, it is really, really hard. And so, what, we're, what I'm trying to do is create a safe place where pastors' wives can come, where women on staff can come, where they don't have to keep up that the appearance that everything is okay because that's what's expected of them. And so that's my heart desire. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. So talk a little bit about the organization you mentioned that you are with. Um, it's for purpose. For one purpose. For one purpose. Well, when we, we needed to have a, a web name, a URL um, name for, for our podcast site for our website and through a quote by Oswald Chambers it says go forth recklessly abandoned totally surrendered and separated by God for one purpose to proclaim the gospel of God and from the very beginning I knew that our website was going to be called for one purpose it just there was no there were no ifs ands or buts about that and so we started off as just a Bible study website where we begin to put the podcasts up there week after week and the homework and things like that so that women overseas could, could access it. And then that opened the doors for me to be able to go overseas and lead a couple of women's retreats for women who were serving overseas for missionaries. And then because of the economy and the way things are going, we began to realize that missions organizations don't have money anymore to sponsor these women's retreats. And so they're falling by the wayside. And so God just really gave me a vision, gave me a heart to begin a nonprofit organization that would be able to 
raise money and then provide retreats for these missionaries who are serving overseas. And so we took the name for one purpose as Bible study ministry and walked through the process of making it into a 501c3 nonprofit organization so that we can go overseas and host retreats. And also now we're going to start hosting local retreats. Um, probably in the spring we'll do like stateside local retreats and then in the fall we'll go overseas. Um, but my focus will be on the stateside retreats on small churches. Um, you know, the big churches have budgets and stuff where they can send for conferences or bring speakers in. There's so many women serving in small churches who don't have that opportunity, and they are constantly pouring out and pouring out and pouring out, and there's nobody pouring into them. And so our desire is to create a, a three-day retreat where they come, and all they have to do is bring their clothes and their Bible, and they get poured into that's fantastic. It's very encouraging, I'm sure. Like, what are some of the places overseas that you've been so far? Um, well, some of them I can't say on camera. Um, I've been to a lot of places overseas. Um, I have not done retreats in as many. Um, I have been in Southeast Asia. I did some ministry in Thailand. Um, most recently, we went to Peru in September. And then this coming September, we will be going to East Asia. That's fantastic. So... It'll be exciting, I'm sure, for you to meet other people in those cultures and different things and be able to pour into them. It's incredible. And, you know, really, we deal with, um, you know, one of the things when we go overseas is that we're dealing with Americans who are living in a foreign culture. And so we get to go and, and minister to them and within their, you know, their cultural context. But even little things for them, like being able to worship in English is a huge deal. We don't even think about that here mm -hmm. in the States. But for them to gather with a group of other believers and to be able to sing in English, to read the scriptures in English, is such an incredible blessing. And it is incredibly exciting to get to go do that. That's fantastic. So for you personally, like, how do you find ways um, to be poured into? Because when you work into these situations like you're in, do you find it difficult for that sometimes? Sometimes. Um, I have a couple of very dear friends that we either, I have one who lives in Oklahoma and we speak on the phone regularly and we pour into each other. And so that's a really great place. I also listen to sermons online. When I walk, I listen to a, ser you know, a sermon and that fills me. Um, and I do spend a lot of time just you know, being quiet and studying and doing that on my own. And so that helps me a lot. But there are times when I realize I'm, I'm running dry and I just have to go. I, I go seek out friends that are really, really walking closely with the Lord and, um, and meet with them. So if you uh, could tell anyone out there that's watching this maybe that is struggling with being alone in ministry or like that, what would you say to them? I would say... Find one person, another pastor's wife, somebody, make yourself vulnerable so that they know that, that you're struggling. Because a lot of times people don't realize that women in ministry are struggling. And so I think it's really important for the person who is in ministry to admit that they're struggling, um, to find a safe place to do that, and to find some form of community. Find a Bible study. If you don't feel like you can go to Bible study at your own church, go to a different church. There's you know, there's BSF, there's community fellowship. There are different Bible studies that a person in leadership could go to um, to find that kind of community. But ultimately, it takes a lot of courage and it takes being vulnerable. So what about a congregation out there that somebody that's in a congregation of, of people, what are some ways that they can encourage the people in leadership or the pastor's wives? Uh, how, what are some ways that they can do that? Oh, man being a friend and being a friend that doesn't expect anything in return and you know a lot of times people in leadership k kind of um they they set themselves apart a little bit just because they're so they can't be a friend to every single person and so and and let's be honest there are times when there are people who want to get in on the inner circle for all the wrong reasons and so but i think for somebody who just goes to church, I think it's essential for all of us who are members of a congregation is to encourage the, the pastor's wife, the women and staff. And you can do that by writing a card, sending a text message, just saying, I'm praying for you. Drop off a meal, send a gift card for coffee, or even just say, you know, I would love to get to know you better. Could we go have coffee together? 
Because oftentimes, nobody does that because the assumption is the pastor's wife, the person on staff, already has so many friends, and so people are afraid to do that. And it's and a lot of times it's the opposite. It's nobody's Absolutely. calling them because yeah. everybody thinks that everybody else is calling them. So it's good to really just communicate with that and appreciation and um, and in that. Not that pastor's wives necessarily want or expect that, but it's just definitely something that's probably needed. Absolutely. I mean, just think about it for yourself. Mm -hmm. How much does it mean to you when you get a random card in the mail from somebody who says, I was thinking about you today, and I just want you to know that I care. I mean, that's like awesome. And so, you know, it's the same. They're just like us. They're just like us. That's great. Well, uh, tell us again your website. It's for the number four and then the words one purpose. Com. And we'll try to include a link on the video too, uh, underneath in the description, so people will be able to go there and listen. Uh, is there a way that through the website that people can contact you if they're yes uh, with the emails or contact button? Yes, there okay, is. Cool. There absolutely is, and we would. I mean, we would want to get the word out because my I believe that the word of God is just the most important thing that we have, and so my desire is for people to be involved in Bible study. Whether you have to do it at home or whether you can gather a group together and listen together, it's just a really great way to do that. Fantastic. Well, thank you again for coming by and updating me on what you're doing. And I'm excited for you. And uh, we'll be praying that everything goes well for you. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank I appreciate you. it.